Patronage of St. Joseph, taken from The Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Geranger. The Easter mysteries are superseded today by a special subject, which is offered for our consideration. The Holy Church invites us to spend this Sunday in honoring the spouse of Mary, the foster father of the Son of God. And yet, as we offered him the yearly tribute of our devotion on the 19th of March, it is not, properly speaking, his feast that we are to celebrate today. It is a solemn expression of gratitude offered to Joseph, the protector of the faithful, the refuge and support of all that invoke him with confidence. The innumerable favors he has bestowed upon the world entitle him to this additional homage. With a view to her children's interests, the Church would, on this day, excite their confidence in this powerful and ever-ready helper. Devotion to St. Joseph was reserved for these latter times. Though based on the Gospel, it was not to be developed in the early ages of the Church. It is not that the faithful were, in any way, checked from showing honor to him who had been called to take so important a part in the mystery of the Incarnation. But Divine Providence had its hidden reasons for retarding the liturgical homage to be paid, each year, to the spouse of Mary. As on other occasions, so here also, the East preceded the West in the special cultus of St. Joseph, but in the 15th century, the whole Latin Church adopted it, and, since that time, it has gradually gained the affections of the faithful. We have treated upon the glories of St. Joseph on the 19th of March. The present feast has its own special object, which we will at once proceed to explain. The goodness of God and our Redeemer's fidelity to His promises have ever kept pace with the necessities of the world, so that, in every age, appropriate and special aid has been given to the world for its maintaining the supernatural life. An uninterrupted succession of seasonable grace has been the result of this merciful dispensation, and each generation has had given to it a special motive for confidence in its Redeemer. Dating from the 13th century, when, as the Church herself assures us, the world began to grow cold, each epoch has had thrown open to it a new source of graces. First of all came the Feast of the Most Blessed Sacrament, with its successive developments of processions, expositions, benedictions, and the Forty Hours. After this followed the devotion of the Holy Name of Jesus, of which St. Bernardine of Siena was the chief propagator, and that of Via Crucis, or the Stations of the Cross, with its wonderful fruit of compunction. The practice of frequent communion was revived in the 16th century, owing principally to the influence of St. Ignatius and the society founded by him. In the 17th century was promulgated the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which was firmly established in the following century. In the 19th, devotion to the Holy Mother of God has made such progress as to form one of the leading supernatural characteristics of the period. The rosary and the scapular, which had been handed down to us in previous ages, have regained their place in the affections of the people. Pilgrimages to the sanctuaries of the Mother of God, which had been interrupted by the influence of Jansenism and rationalism, have been removed. The archconfraternity of the Sacred Heart of Mary has spread throughout the whole world. Numerous miracles have been wrought in reward for the fervent faith of individuals. In a word, our present century has witnessed the triumph of the Immaculate Conception, a triumph which had been looked forward to for many previous ages. Now, devotion to Mary could never go on increasing as it has done without bringing with it a fervent devotion to St. Joseph. We cannot separate Mary and Joseph, were it only for their having such a close connection with the mystery of the Incarnation Mary as being the mother of the Son of God, and Joseph as being guardian of the Virgin's spotless honor and foster father of the Divine Babe. A special veneration for St. Joseph was the result of increased devotion to Mary. Nor is this reverence for Mary's spouse to be considered only as a just homage paid to his admirable prerogatives. 
It is, moreover, a fresh and exhaustless source of help to the world, for Joseph has been made our protector by the Son of God himself. Hearken to the inspired words of the Church's liturgy. Thou, O Joseph, art the delight of the blessed, the sure hope of our life, and the pillar of the world. Extraordinary as is this power, need we be surprised as it's being given to a man like Joseph, whose connections with the Son of God on earth were so far above those of all other men? Jesus deigned to be subject to Joseph here below. Now that he is in heaven, he would glorify the creature to whom he consigned the guardianship of his own childhood and his mother's honor. He has given him a power which is above our calculations. Hence, it is that the Church invites us, on this third Sunday after Easter, to have recourse with unreserved confidence to this all-powerful protector. The world we live in is filled with miseries which would make stronger hearts than ours quake with fear. But let us invoke St. Joseph with faith, and we shall be protected. In all our necessities, whether of soul or body, in all the trials and anxieties we may have to go through, let us have recourse to St. Joseph, and we shall not be disappointed. The king of Egypt said to his people, when they were suffering from famine, Go to Joseph. The king of heaven says the same to us. The faithful guardian of Mary has greater influence with God than Jacob's son had with Pharaoh. As usual, God revealed this new spiritual aid to a privileged soul, that she might be the instrument of its propagation. The words of St. Teresa are as follows. I took for my patron and lord the glorious St. Joseph, and recommended myself earnestly to him. I saw clearly that he rendered me greater services than I knew how to ask for. I cannot call to mind that I have ever asked him at any time for anything which he has not granted, and I am filled with amazement when I consider the great favors which God hath given me through this blessed saint. To other saints, our Lord seems to have given grace to succor men in some special necessity. But to this glorious saint, I know by experience, to help us in all. And our Lord would have us to understand that, as he himself was subject to him upon earth, for St. Joseph having the title of father, and being his guardian, could command him, so now in heaven he performs all his petitions. I have asked others to recommend themselves to St. Joseph, and they too know this by experience. And there are many who are now of late devout to him, having had experience of this truth. The faithful could not remain indifferent with such teaching as this. The seed thus soon produced its fruit, slowly it is true, but surely. Even in the first half of the seventeenth century, there prevailed amidst the devout clients of St. Joseph a presentiment that the day would come when the Church, through her liturgy, would urge the faithful to have recourse to him as her powerful protector. In a book published in the year 1645, we find these almost prophetic words. O thou bright sun, thou father of our days, speed thy onward course, and give us that happy day, whereon are to be fulfilled the prophecies of the saints. They have said that in the latter ages of the world, the glories of St. Joseph will be brought to light, that God will draw aside the veil which has hitherto prevented us from seeing the wondrous sanctuary of Joseph's soul, that the Holy Ghost will inspire the faithful to proclaim the praises of this admirable saint and to build monasteries, churches, and altars in his honor, that throughout the entire kingdom of the church militant, he shall be considered as the special protector, for he was the protector of the very founder of that kingdom, namely, our Lord Jesus Christ. That the sovereign pontiffs will, by a secret impulse from heaven, ordain that the feasts of this great patriarch be solemnly celebrated through the length and breadth of the spiritual domain of St. Peter. That the most learned of men of the world will use their talents in studying the divine gifts hidden in St. Joseph, and that they will find in him treasures of grace incomparably more precious and plentiful than were the choicest of the elect of the Old Testament, 
during the whole 4,000 years of its duration. These ardent wishes have been fulfilled. It is now more than a century ago that the Carmelites sought and obtained the approbation of the Holy See for an office in honor of the patronage of St. Joseph. A great number of dioceses obtained permission to use it. A Sunday was selected for the celebration of this new feast, in order that the faithful might be, in a way, compelled to keep it. For the Feast of St. Joseph in March is not a day of obligation for the Universal Church, and, as it always falls during Lent, it cannot be kept on a Sunday, since the Sundays of Lent exclude a feast of that rite. That the new feast might not be attended with the same risk of being unnoticed, it was put upon a Sunday, the third Sunday after Easter, that thus the consolations of such a solemnity might be blended with the paschal joys. The new feast went on gradually spreading from one diocese to another, till at last there was unexpectedly issued an apostolic decree, dated September 10, 1847, which ordered it to be kept throughout Christendom. The Church was on the eve of severe trials, and her glorious pontiff, Pius IX, by a sacred instinct, was prompted to draw down on the flock entrusted to him the powerful protection of St. Joseph, who, assuredly, has never had greater miseries and dangers to avert from the world than those which threaten the present age. Let us henceforth have confidence in the patronage of St. Joseph. He is the father of the faithful, and it is God's will that he, more than any other saint, should have power to apply to us the blessings of the mystery of the Incarnation, the great mystery whereof he, after Mary, was the chief earthly minister. Please be sure to watch my video on the pre-1955 Mass in honor of St. Joseph, patron of the Church, which was mentioned throughout this presentation. Special thanks to my channel members for your support.